Age makes no difference till you open your mouth. Use your time just to work things out. I know that you can't understand. Good evening and welcome to our UE News Politics Special. I'm Charlotte Penkeff King. And I'm Luke Jacob. Making my headlines this evening. The Bristol mayoral race is hotting up. A look into the future of the Temple Meads area. And later in the programme, a look into the widespread concern over the latest MP tax scandals. The Brexit debate is heating up fiercely in the run-up to the referendum on June 23rd. Our reporter Dan Nouch is live in the UWE Garden for us to talk us through how the referendum affects Bristol. Dan, Jeremy Corbyn made a speech this morning about the EU referendum. What did he have to say? Well, his message was quite clear, Charlotte. He told the audience that he expected Labour supporters to vote to stay in the EU. In his speech in London, he said that migration brings benefits as well as challenges. He also pleaded with young people to register and vote as they will be the ones that will face the consequences for the longest and the most. Last night, Leave EU lost a vote leave in the race to become the official campaigners for the Leave uh, the EU. Aaron Banks is a Bristolian entrepreneur who was uh, one of the ambassadors for Leave EU and he was backed by Nigel Farage. The winners, Vote Leave, uh, said that uh, Banks and Farage would alienate voters with a focus on, my, uh, on immigration. Last week, one of Bristol's biggest employers uh, wrote to its 4,000 employees to advise them to stay in the EU. Airbus has manufacturing sites uh, in Filton and they said in their letter as a successful international company with a strong European heritage we are proud that much of the world flies on British built wings. We believe that the UK remaining active in reforming the EU can improve our position and as a commercial business that operates in a globally competitive environment we need to maintain every competitive advantage in the UK that we have. So where do Bristol's MPs and the South West MEP stand on this situation? Well, half of the city's MPs want to stay, with two wanting to leave. That's Chris Skidmore and Jack Leprezzi. Bristol's North West Conservative MP, Charlotte Leslie, is still undecided as to whether she will vote to stay or to leave. In terms of the MEPs, two are set to vote to leave. They are the two uh, UKIP MEPs, while the other four are going to say stay. Um, and remember, if you are one of the lucky people going to Glastonbury this summer, you will have to register for a postal vote with this Somerset Festival coinciding with the EU referendum on June the 20 23rd. And remember, if you want to vote in the EU, uh, referendum. The deadline is June the 7th and the details on how you can uh, vote are on your screen now. Back to you in the studio. A recent opinion poll from the Observer indicated that the decision over whether the UK remains in the EU could depend heavily on the vote of young people. The online survey by Opinion found that in the age for 18 to 34 age group, 53% said they were back staying in against 29% who wanted to leave. Government strategists and pollsters have admitted that the main problem for the Remain side is that its support for staying in the EU is strongest among Britain's youngest population, the group least likely to vote. At the University of the West of England, the institution holds over 3,500 international students, with 946 coming from the EU. But with the survey currently showing the Leave side to be at 43%, four points ahead of the Remain, how are the students taking our news? Our reporter, George Gardner, spoke to UWE students to get their thoughts. It is a the moment, so uh, we'll be, I think we, we, we think we should stay in. I mean, there are downsides to being in the EU. It's not perfect, but certainly it provides a lot of stability, it provides peace, and that's something we can't say that has happened before. Pretty undecided, to be honest, because obviously there's benefits from both sides. Like, as a student, the main thing for me, like food prices going up, we exit. The Remain camp is aware of the need to mobilise young people behind the campaign after Education Secretary Nicky Morgan made a speech last week saying it would be young people who would suffer most if the UK left the EU. Morgan's message was aimed not only at changing the apathy of young individuals towards voting, but also at focusing parents and grandparents on the dangers of Brexit to the next generation. 
Some 54% of voters aged 55 and over said they wanted to leave, against 30% who wanted the UK to remain in the EU. So it remains to be seen how the campaign will engage these target groups in making an informed opinion on the voting process. I'm George Gardner for UE News. The race to become the next mayor of Bristol is coming to an end next month. Green Party candidate Tony Dyer is one of 13 candidates hoping to take the reins from current mayor George Ferguson. Our reporter Oliver Bishop went to meet the candidate to hear more about his campaign. With Bristol mayoral elections nearly upon us, the run-up is reaching the penultimate stage. Green Party candidate Tony Dyer faces stiff competition for another 12 candidates, including Labour's Marvin Rees and the current mayor George Ferguson. In what will be a hectic run-up to the election, Tony Dyer took the time out to explain the housing situation in Bristol and why it's so important for students to vote. We have a, no, a real shortage of housing. There is a housing crisis na nationally and particularly in Bristol. Um, so my commitment is to, to create a Bristol housing company which will work in partnership uh, with other uh, parties to deliver 8,000 homes. Um, we're looking for at least 2,800 of those to be affordable. And the problem is that affordable sometimes isn't always affordable, so within that, we're aiming at that at least 2,000 homes will be at something called target social rent, which is essentially the level of rent you would, pay, you would pay if it was a council house. The thing to point out is that at the moment, only 54% of the young people, that's 18 to 24, are registered to vote, and only about 44% of them actually went out to vote in the general election. Whereas if you look at older generations, they get much higher turnout. Um, and the result is that too often younger people are left out of uh, policy decisions. Uh, they're the ones that end up being the victims. Um, it's why we have a ne this fake living wage where it's, you can only actually get if you're over 25, you're, if you're under 25, forget it. If you're on job seekers allowance and you're under 25, you don't get housing benefit. These are all these decisions that affect the lives of students. And also don't forget that some of the decisions that be been made are going to have long-term impacts into the future and it's you guys that are going to be carrying the burden of that in the future so get out there and vote and if you don't think any of the candidates are worth your vote then put a massive cross through all of the other names and spoil your ballot paper so that people can't just say oh young people just don't care although Diana has a slim chance in the upcoming election it's clear to see he stands up for what he believes in voting takes place may the 5th i'll be voting will you the British mayoral battle is coming to a head on the 5th of May. We're going over to our reporter Tilly Haynes bringing you a live overview of what each candidate is looking to achieve if elected. Thanks guys. This year we have 13 candidates campaigning, all from varied lifestyles and political stances. First off we have current mayor George Ferguson. He believes that so far he has brought improvement to Bristol and wants to continue with this by making it a healthier city with less pollution and much faster movement by 2020. He wants major projects within Bristol and pledges to deliver the arena no matter what. He is also keen to get full employment for anybody that is able to work. Next is the popular runner from the Labour Party, Marvin Rees. He sees house building as a top priority to support those needing affordable homes. Transport is something that a lot of the candidates see as a major issue, so Marvin wants to set up a publicly run bus company so that people have control over transport. He says that Bristol needs to be more socially and economically inclusive. He plans to have a cabinet that combines all co political parties. Charles Lucas from the Conservatives is keen to improve rail links and to create a com comprehensive integrated transport policy. He wants a station at the Ashton Gate Stadium. He also wants to extend resident parking zones, but does not want 20 mile per, per hour zones to stay. One important pledge from Charles is that he wants a 75% veto for councillors over a mayoral decision. Kay Bernard from the Lib Dems wants to introduce bus quality contracts to give the local authority control over routes and fares. She wants more local rail stations and an improved rail network. Kay is also passionate about improving social care. Tony Dyer, our Green Party candidate, is keen to build affordable homes in Bristol, claiming to see potential for 2,000 new homes around the city. He also wants to see a Bristol version of the Oyster Card for easier travel. Paul Turner from UKIP wants to get rid of 20 mile per hour zones unless they are outside of schools or hospitals. He also wants to build new homes to tackle Bristol's homelessness and thinks that prefab homes like the ones made after World War II would be a good idea. 
Tom Baldwin from the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition wants an affordable city for all, with council contracts being taken back in-house. He wants a publicly owned transport system and improved employment for young people. Now we're moving on to our independent candidates. John Langley wants to unite the city and thinks that people should have a say in how their council tax is spent. He wants to scrap resident parking zones. Paul Saville feels that rent in Bristol is too high and that it needs to be addressed to tackle homelessness. He also feels that communities and people need to be encouraged to be more engaged as everyone has a point of view. Christine Townsend is passionate about education and would like a cabinet filled with a member from each political party. She also says that she would delegate to show real democracy. Tony Britt is disabled, dyslexic and has cancer. He says that even though he won't win, his aim is to inspire young people to try. He wants parents to be able to see their kids and wants Legacy Pot, which would be a scheme for helping young people. Stoney Garner is famous for his red hat. He wants to sort out congestion, get rid of resident parking zones and introduce an Oyster card to Bristol. Finally, we have Mayor Festus Kudimbu, who wants no 20 mile per hour speed limits and wants to create jobs and sort out traffic. That was a very brief overview of our candidates. Don't forget to cast your vote for the 2016 mayoral election. Thanks, Tilly. While George Ferguson and Marvin Rees appear to be the early frontrunners for office, other candidates still have a strong footing in the city. Earlier, we spoke to Tom Baldwin from a trade union and socialist coalition party and asked him why he was standing for mayor. Well, I think things are hard for most people out there at the moment. We've seen lots of cuts to our living standards, to jobs and services. There's a lot of people that are sticking up for themselves, uh, campaigning against that. But ordinary people don't have a voice in the council at the moment. Our representatives are telling us there's nothing that can be done but to pass on the Tory cuts. And I think that's got to stop. Uh, and that's why I'm running myself. And so what does your party stand for? Well, I'm standing for the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition. It was formed in order to give a voice back to ordinary people, standing to defend our jobs and services, to increase people's pay, to sort out the problems with housing. Uh, and we're socialists. We want to see a society where the wealth created by working people comes back to us. So what are your plans for the future of Bristol if you're elected? I think the first thing we need to do is stand up to the vicious funding cuts that we faced. So we would move a budget based on what the city needs, not what George Osborne is demanding, and then build a campaign to win back that funding that's been stolen from us. That's great. Thank you very much Thank for joining you. us. Cheers. Good Thank luck you. on May 5th. Thank you. Would you like to decide what happens to the Temple Meads area in the next quarter of a century? The council's public consultation period is coming to a close. Naomi Sandercock went out to discover what people want to see. Local residents only have a few hours left to have their say on the Bristol Temple Quarter area. The six weeks consultation period on the future of the area will end today at 5pm. The 173 acre site is set in the heart of Bristol with Temple Meads train station at its core. The Bristol Temple Quarter aims to attract 4,000 jobs by 2017 and around 17,000 in total an arena, a harbour walkway and better public transport facilities are among the key elements that the project hopes to bring. Work has already begun to create new access routes with the construction of the arena set to start later this year. Local businesses and commuters told us their outlook on the plans for Bristol Temple Quarter. Well, for a market like this it probably be good because it would provide a lot more footfall. might be a bit of an eyesore but it's in the centre of the city so... I don't know, it could, could work well. Um, we're going to end up getting moved. Uh, I'm not sure where yet, we haven't been told, but we'll get moved uh, eventually. Great, it's a long overdue. Can't wait for it to be uh, completed. In the wake of recent Panama Papers tax scandal, we spoke to Ovation tax advisor Steve Jones about the implications of David Cameron's tax controversy. Obviously a big difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance and part of what we do is tax avoidance, legitimate ways of saving tax. Um, as far as tax evasion goes, it's uh, a, a very different thing altogether. I mean the David Cameron um, issues, uh, it's really very much a storm in a teacup 
Um, I mean, the fact that he was named on that um, Panama Leaks thing, um, when you look in more depth to what it is he had and he did, um, there wasn't any tax evasion there at all as far as we're concerned. Um, with him in particular. It was a hedge fund. It wasn't even a particularly tax efficient way of doing it. There would be more tax efficient ways of, of structuring it than he did. So um, as far as he's concerned, um, absolutely legal. Um, even ethically, I think he can probably sleep quite well at night. I don't think he's even tried to manipulate um, laws and rules around it. The minute it came out, um, he should have published exactly what it was, but he did the silly thing of trying to only tell little bits of the truth, and then, you know, good journalists dig and dig and dig, and, and it all comes out eventually. That's it from the experts. Our mobile reporters hit the streets to find out what Bristolians thought about the matter. People are evading tax and they should be brought to justice. I mean, that's, uh, evading tax is illegal. Avoiding tax. Mr Cameron talks about aggressively avoiding tax, which he used the, the example of the comedian, whatever his name was, Alan Carr, was it, or somebody? Anyway, he got into a scheme which was declared uh, a tax of, uh, evasion scheme, uh, and he heavily criticised him, but he seems to be doing the same sort of thing as far as... No, because he didn't evade tax. He paid, he paid tax. What do you think of his um, father's evasion of tax? It was £30,000 that... Um, yes, but you still pay tax on it. I, I disagree with offshore, but they legally didn't do anything wrong. It's it's really bad, actually. Like Everyone, here, everyone else is paying tax, and why shouldn't he be, be able to pay the taxes? That's why I reckon... So we're getting close to the weekend. Is it going to stay dry and sunny? Let's head over to Matt with the weather. Today's weather is looking fairly all right with a light southeasterly breeze hitting the West Country all day. Temperatures are reaching a high of 15 degrees and at 4 p.m. a low of 9 degrees throughout the night. Expect to see a little shower between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. However, skies will dry up with a little bit of cloud staying around until 10 p.m. this evening. So if you're heading out on the town for a wild Thursday night, make sure to take an umbrella with you. Friday is looking a little bit of a damp day with rain expected to start from 3pm and stick around until 9 in the evening. Wind direction is heading north easterly but throughout the day will start to head northerly before ending the day in a north westerly direction. The morning is looking very cloudy with high temperature reaching 12 degrees and a low of 5 degrees at the early hours of Saturday morning. Now for Saturday. Morning and into early afternoon it's looking very bright with the temperature reaching up to 9 degrees with a northerly breeze passing through. However, as the day reaches 4pm, expected light showers to continue until 7pm before the sun makes a strong comeback. So if you're looking for a nice day out in the sun, make sure to hit the parks before 4pm. But as the sun has got his hat back on from 7pm, make sure that you can make the most of your Saturday evening if you're out at the bars or just relaxing in your garden. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and make sure to make the most of the sunshine. That's all from me, and back to the studio. We've had a great look into the world of politics on the show today. We'll be back next week for more news, weather and sport from the city of Bristol. I'm Charlotte Penketh-King. And I'm Luke Jacob, with UE News every afternoon at 3.